Welcome. Uh, welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock, a special Saturday edition of Fearless with Jason Whitlock. Uh, Jill Savage is here with me. She was here with me yesterday as we talked about the abortion issue. Uh, she's returned for this special Saturday edition. Uh, we got Michelle, Michelle Tafoya coming on uh, to talk about her uh, controversial, contentious interview with Dan Levitard. I have a lot, a lot uh, that I need to say about this, but I want to first frame it up and get you guys up to speed on what happened so that you can understand my conversation uh, with uh, Michelle Tafoya. And so we're going to first skip ahead to, and again, if you haven't heard, Michelle went on uh, Fox News. She went on a Gutfeld show and talked about getting ambushed during an interview. And it was during her podcast interview on the Dan Levitard show. And so I want to first play you how Dan Levitard introduced Michelle Tafoya. This is the second clip, the, the Levitard and his introduction of Michelle Tafoya. How is it that I think I'm in the middle and you think you're in the middle and I'm looked at as far left and you're looked at as far right when all I look at is, man, our leadership everywhere stinks. Uh, the, uh, the Republicans seem ruthless to me and the Democrats seem weak, seem weak and none of them represent me. That's how Michelle Tafoya was introduced on the Dan Levitard podcast. She's not introduced as, hey, this sideline reporter on America's number one TV show, you transition, uh, you've stepped away from the number one TV show in America to more enter the political lane. Uh, Michelle, tell us why you did that. that. That's not how she's introduced. She's put into a box, Dan pretends to put himself into a box, and, and then after that introduction, and Michelle's response, then about two minutes in, two minutes into this interview, Dan lets Mike Ryan, his jackoff producer, take over the interview. Uh, watch this, this starts around uh, two minutes into the interview. He takes over and starts talking about Jack Del Rio and accusing her of being a conservative. Mike Ryan takes over the interview. If I may, you led with your uh, a pro-choice libertarian and your fiscal conservative, and then you said, uh, I don't want to believe that uh, one group is oppressed and another party is oppressors. And that is like, that is eschewing just, hey, I'm a fiscal conservative. Sociologically speaking, I am a conservative and I believe in law and order. These are all platform issues and, and slogans of a, of a party that is not just fiscally conservative. Yeah, so she's committed the crime of being a conservative. He's brought the evidence, and now he wants her to defend her, uh, herself. Michelle actually does a great job of like, oh boy, this is not going the direction I, I, I want it to go. And so she starts fighting back, and then so Mike Ryan, this jack-off producer, who has nothing to do with her being on the show, uh, he then turns to uh, the assistant black jackoff producer, Roy Bellamy, I think is his name, and, and invites him into the conversation. Uh, let's play that. I, for those that don't know and are just listening to audio, what you seized on as confirmation when I extended my arm was, I was bringing in my fellow producer, Roy Bellamy, who, who feels very passionately about critical race theory and might be able to uh, speak to it a little bit better than I. So I was just welcoming him to the floor, I guess, Thank you for the vine. We'll just welcome him in. Yeah, basically, critical race theory is policies. Uh, this country is built off of racism, like slavery and whatnot, and policies that are built to um, that, that that have built this country is basically built off of slavery and racism, and how that is affecting today's life. Basically, what is what CRT is. They brought on a football sideline reporter. America's number one TV show, and within minutes, they've dragged her into a hostile political interview, three different guys, Levitard and his two jack-off producers. Then Michelle Tafoya realizes what's happening and talks about, and this is a very, click, uh, a very quick clip where she's like, holy cow, 
I've made a bunch of enemies instantly. Let's play that. And if you deny that you're racist, that just uh, underscores the fact that you are racist. And if you accept that you're racist, then you're just, again, underscoring that you're racist. So there's no win there. It, I'm sorry, why are you shaking your head? You, there's no, I've barely spoken three minutes on this program, I'm and I feel like I've made three enemies. <laughs> so she's now eight, nine minutes into the interview. It's clearly hostile. It's clearly three on one. Uh, it, it's clearly a hot mess. Lebetard has disappeared. He's hiding off in a closet uh, on the show. He's brought on Michelle Tafoya. He's used it. I think, I think let's, let's show the invitation. Michelle shared with me the invitation, the confirmation of the uh, invitation of her email uh, that they sent confirming her on the show where they talk about they want to uh, address her amazing career and her new sideline a uh, uh, sideline, what's it called, sideline sanity. sanity podcast or whatever. Uh, that's how they frame up the interview. That's what she was given and what she thought she was going to be talking about. Ten minutes in, Lebetard has disappeared. He starts the first two minutes, then he disappears for ten minutes, turning it over to his little jackoff producers, and they begin to do what jackoff producers do. They're in over their heads. They can't deal with Michelle Tafoya. She's a seasoned, experienced person. She starts fighting back very politely, and, and Levitard sees that it's going badly. And then Dan jumps in with a half-hearted BS apology. Let's listen to this. The, the, the beginning part of this, let's go back to the beginning, when I was joking about the caricatures that people become by making myself the wokest, and then if I'm the wokest of the rex wrestling characters, then you must be on the dark side. It was a joke. Okay. I was not walking you into a trap. I have not talked to you in, in a long time, and the last experience I had with you was lovely. I was not looking for this to become that. I am sorry, genuinely, that uh, upon introduction, uh, I was awkward and you missed construed uh the no, entry point. I, I knew you were joking i honestly i didn't know you were joking dan so michelle's playing nice and doing a little bit of a rope-a-dope strategy giving them a, but th there's before she came on i want to play this clip this is before she came on it's about 15 seconds of how dan framed the interview you know, he, he's, oh, I, I had nothing but the best intentions. Everything was lovely, blah, blah, blah. But let's play the, the very first clip where he puts out a poll and prediction on how this interview is going to go. You know, Michelle Tafoya is around the corner. Put on the poll, please, Roy, at Lebetard Show. How's Tafoya going to go? Chaos, inflammatory, awkward, or cordial are your choices. Michelle Tafoya will be here in a second. He's lying. He's clearly lying. This is a group of beta males, three beta males, uh, trying to ambush a woman, uh, trying to ambush a political conservative, and they're in over their heads. She starts kicking their ass all over the place. He gets embarrassed, offers up an apology. Then he walks her through the typical left-wing talking points. Oh, they're whitewashing textbooks. Uh, oh, uh, abortion uh, uh, is, a, is a problem. They're taking women's rights away. Oh, uh, there's a don't say gay bill in Florida. What do you think about that? And then eventually, and I want to play the very last clip, uh, he plays the St. George Floyd card. This, this is the go-to move. Uh, Michelle Tafoya is white, Hispanic, or, you know, so, but she ain't black, and so when the left get in trouble, they play the St. George Floyd card. Here's Levitar playing the George Floyd. Michelle, that teaches, though, critical race thinking, uh, you know, that would teach the, how the systemic police brutality that you find is built by police orders that come from, that descend from the slave system and treat whites differently than they do others. Like, that's, that's the... That's at the soul of the facts in the history. She's a Sunday night football reporter. And again, I know she's 
stepped off and said, you know, had some comments about critical race theory and what our kids are experiencing in school, whatever. But they debate her about don't say gay. They debate her about police brutality, uh, the Tulsa massacre incident. This is three cowards. This is one of the most cowardly displays I've ever seen in my life. Dan Lebatard and I used to be friends years ago. He was one of my best friends in the media industry uh, years ago. I've never seen anybody descend into this level of cowardly, cowardliness as I've seen from Dan Lebatard and his treatment of Michelle Tafoya. Michelle Tafoya is going to come on uh, just around the corner and we're gonna go further into this, but I just wanted to give you all that framework so you could understand if you hadn't heard of this story, hadn't followed it, uh, we're gonna do a complete and full deep dive on it. Uh, the LaBeta show versus Michelle Tafoya, it was a knockout. They did not get the knockout they were looking for. They got knocked out. Three beta males, three male cowards got knocked out by one female reporter. It was embarrassing. All right, don't go anywhere. Uh, Michelle Tafoya. All right, welcome back to a special Saturday edition of Fearless with Jason Whitlock. You get more of me on a Saturday? Everybody's got to be happy. Uh, we're going to roll out to Minneapolis and bring in uh, Michelle Tafoya and continue our conversation. Uh, Michelle, obviously uh, the former sideline reporter for Sunday Night Football, America's number one uh, television show. She left Sunday Night Football. She left America's number one TV show because she wanted to get involved with Saving America uh, and the culture war and just, I don't even know if she wants to call it the culture war, but she just wanted to have <laughs> her voice heard on more important issues than what to do on third and long. Uh, and so she started a Sideline Sanity podcast. Uh, she's uh, helping, uh, I f why am I forgetting the man you're helping run for governor? Uh, well, because in, in he's, Minnesota. he's no. Well, it was Kendall Qualls. He's no longer running. Uh, he did not get the Republican endorsement. It was an ugly, ugly affair that you would have um, been disgusted at. And anyway, so that's 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 past. <laughs> mm. Well, Michelle, I left you out of the open of this show because I think you have too much class uh, for how angry I am at Dan Lebatard and his show. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I didn't want you to be a part. I, I'm going to mock this guy, and I wanted to mock him away from you and, and what his <laughs> show did. I'm, the La Beta show is what we're calling it, because uh, that was – you beat up three beta males. I, 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 I got to say, I was offended by the podcast and inspired by the podcast. So I was like, look at Michelle – beat up these three men <laughs> who thought they were going to ambush her. She went in and stood toe to toe. They couldn't knock you off your feet. Michelle, I, when, when I heard you say you were ambushed and then I went and watched the, the video, I was like, yeah, they did try to ambush you, but I think you ambushed them. Well, I'm happy that you see it that way, Jason. It sure didn't feel like it in the moment. Uh, I've had I, I haven't watched it back because the experience was was disgusting and I don't want to relive it. Um, but people, friends, family who have watched it back are saying, "Hey, you held your own." I I wish I had known what they wanted to talk about. I I may have still gone on, but I wasn't prepared at all to talk about these things because that wasn't their invitation to me. So when out of the gate, it, I just started getting pummeled. I, I was really, I was a little shocked, a little thrown off and, and realized I had stepped into a trap and it was, and that made it all the more distasteful to me because it wasn't a conversation. It wasn't a civil debate. It wasn't any of those things. It was, Hey, let's hammer this person because her views differ from ours. Well, the accusation was, Oh my God, Michelle Tafoy is a conservative. Defend yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that was the <laughs> yeah. How dare you be a conservative? Defend yeah. yourself. And 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 first of all, you established very quickly, like, hey guys, I'm not some 
cla- I'm not George Will. I'm not Georgia right. Will. I'm I'm right. I'm a libertarian that's you know pro-choice, uh, mm-hmm. and so you didn't want to be put in any sort of box, right. but they certainly wanted to put you in one. Yeah, they they countered that with, well, if you're those things, then how can you possibly be in support of these things? What they don't understand about libertarianism is you you really are sort of following a doctrine of just leave everyone alone, you know. And but being pro-choice, I, I, I think that that takes me to one side socially. I'm a fiscal conservative. That takes me to another side. I feel like I'm pretty average middle road human being, but they jumped on stuff. One of the things that really bothered me, Jason, I don't know if you remember this moment. They asked me for examples of critical race theory. <laughs> you remember it all? Yeah, I unfortunately do too. And when I tried to give examples of where I saw CRT infiltrating my kids' schools, the producer who I don't even want to name his name, said, yeah, yeah, we know about your son and the little lunches, they were separated. And it was so demeaning and disrespectful and unprofessional. And I was I was stunned because, yeah, this is my kid and he is being separated from his friends at lunch because of the color of their skin. I just don't dig that. Well, Michelle, what they did and what is so shocking is, and I talked about this at the beginning of the show, is I used to be, Dan Lebertard, I considered my best friend in the sports media business. We were very wow. close, know his family. Wow. Uh, I, I, Dan and I and our girlfriends at the time, we vacationed together. Uh, the guy was my best friend. And what, wow. what I saw and what really bothered me is like, your humanity was completely erased. Mm -hmm. Michelle Tafoya, a mother, was erased. No, this is Michelle Tafoya, a conservative, a political opponent. And so yes, when you tried to talk about your kid's experience, there was no recognition of that because you weren't a human being. You were just a political opponent that they were there to defeat and none of them, and, and I don't mean this in any kind of sexist way possible. None of them man enough to take you on one-on-one. They invited you to a gang initiation. And, yeah. and, and Levitar's the leader of the gang, and two minutes in, he brings you on air, and two minutes in, he checks out and turns you over to his little Vato, Mike Ryan, uh, who now <laughs> pretends because it's popular he's gonna pick up his the name Ruiz as well, and put that in parentheses and tell you, I'm a Latino man, uh, yeah. you know, as it, and then I'm an independent. And you're like, hey, 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 what's all these labels and all this other stuff? Yeah. It was crazy. I, I want to play for you because you haven't rewatched it. I've watched yeah, it oh, three goody. times, I think, now. <laughs> uh, okay. I want to replay one of your first comments. It, 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 or maybe it was after Dan's introduction, which tried mm-hmm. to cast you guys both into little boxes. Here was your first comment, your first response to them. Well, that's then I wouldn't say that you're on the far left. So and I wouldn't I don't know who sees me on the far right. I mean, I'm a pro-choice libertarian. I, I don't know how that makes me far right. Um, all I am is a fiscal conservative who really wants America to come together and for people to be able to realize their potentials and not be told that they're oppressed or that they are an oppressor. That's, that's kind of boils it down for me. I'd like to see some law and order so people don't get hurt. Okay. Uh, but No, but let's, let's just stop there for a second, right? Because I think one of the things that gets lost here and, and to me, what I struggle with specifically where we earn our living Uh, You know, you on the sidelines of a very big event where uh, we are capitalizing on black bodies and my history uh, in this uh, sport and my talking about race relations for a long time is part of what ends up making me unpopular or uh, or different. Like some of the ways that you talk about race uh, feel make it feel to me like um, like the cry for equality feels too much like a threat for my liking. Um, the cry for equality? Yes. 
What, what have I said that makes you feel that way? No, I'm not not right now. I'm saying things that I have read and what I believe about perhaps things I assume about your viewpoint, but I can't check all the boxes with you because again, I don't know how you feel. Uh, you have said you're pro uh, you're pro life. That does not. I'm pro choice. No, no, no. Pro choice. Excuse pro me. Choice. Yeah, Let's pro, be careful here. Yeah, pro choice. That does not fit with uh, with the checking of the boxes. It, it so this is comical. Those were her first comments on the interview. And he jumps to all these conclusions and assumptions and, and somehow uh, Michelle being a sideline reporter for NFL games, we're capitalizing on black bodies and somehow your uh, cry for equality. Or, and it's like, well, what is she saying? What are you talking about? And that's where I give you credit. It's like, you instantly, you were like, oh my God, this isn't <laughs> what I'm expecting. <laughs> and like Mike Tyson walking across the room against Michael Spinks, you hit him with a knockout blow in the first few minutes. That's why he checked <laughs> out and turned you over to everybody else. We didn't hear from the guy for another 10 minutes on an I interview know. that, it, it was embarrassing. Jill, I want, Jill Savage is here with me. I'm going to let her jump in. I, I, Hi, Jill. You had to be proud of Michelle. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> Michelle. Hi, nice to, nice to meet you virtually here. Um, I also left the sidelines to jump into the political realm. And I think much like you, it's it's passion and purpose coming together yeah. uh, and, mm -hmm. and saying that there is a fight uh, that is a little bit bigger than, like Jason said, third, third and long on the sidelines. Yeah. Um, but for me, when I watched that interview with you, like, like Jason was saying, when Dan Levitard let that go on for 10 minutes before mm -hmm. he jumped in and he said, oh, I'm sorry. No, you're not sorry. You let that go on. And then yeah. for people that, that haven't seen the whole thing, at one point, it, it, it is an ambush because they not only had the, the three people on the microphones, but there were about six or seven people within the room and they would mute those microphones, cut to your camera, and you could tell that they were all trying to get together to figure out what their next question was going to be for you. Yeah, yeah, at one point I said something and the one guy who was really coming after me, again, I, I'm not gonna say his name, he, I could lip read, cause I can see them right on the Zoom, and I could see him going, oh, my God, oh, my God. Like, I had barely gotten two words out, and he had already decided that whatever it was that I was saying, which he wasn't listening to, clearly, uh, was so abhorrent that he turned to the rest of them like, jump in here, everyone. What what do we need to say next? And and I, it was it was crazy. Uh, crazy is a good word because I, I, I felt like I was standing there talking to people who weren't listening. They had their, they, you know, I was just a, a piñata, a political piñata, and they were swinging at it. And so it was really uncomfortable, really gross. Um, and, and again, the reason I felt ambushed was the invitation to me was, We'd love to talk about your long, great career and your new podcast. And they did it through a booker. And I'm not going to name her either because she was absolutely mortified after this happened. She was the one that booked me. She was the one that went through my my channels and found me and found a way, found a time, booked it. And then later said, can we confirm we want 30 to 40 minutes because you've had such a great career. We want to talk all about it. I, I'm not kidding you. I think I sent uh, Jason the, the, the. No, we, we showed is. him. Yeah. 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 So it was. That was the impression I had. Now, shame on me, because I should have done more due diligence on my part. But I was trusting sort of the go-betweens and, and my previous relationship with Dan Levitard, which wasn't at all like yours, Jason, but I had worked with him. He and I co-hosted Pardon the Interruption once together long ago, and there was nothing even close to this. So I, I was sort of basing it on that, trusting the whole process, and, and then... Bam! You know, it was like running into a brick wall. Well, I want to go back to the fact that where my disappointment stems from is just the erasure and this whole political divide we have where, and, and again, maybe it's only my experience, and I'm just speaking anecdotally, but I have friends who are leftists, who are atheists, 
who are who disagree with me politically. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely still adore and love them and would do all the same things I've done my entire life for them and with them. They don't, many of them, I'm not saying all, but many of them don't have that same feeling towards me. And they have completely distanced themselves and somehow I'm the enemy, they don't communicate with me or whatever. And that's, again, I, what just so disappointed me is like, this is a colleague, a very respected colleague, who your footprint in the political world is so tiny compared to <laughs> your footprint in the sports world. I don't understand how anybody could see you as some sort of uh, political opponent that needs to be assassinated. And so I, I was sitting there watching this going like, okay, let's say I had someone on here who on my show that I completely disagree with. And yeah. I'm gonna give I'm gonna give a female example, Katie Nolan. I don't think okay. much of her uh, as a blah blah. But I promise you this, and I've written bad things about Katie Nolan. If I brought her on this show, I would ask her questions, let her talk, ask her more respectful questions, let her talk. It's not about me. It's not about beating her. Because what they could have done is interviewed you. Dan could have done yeah. a whole 30 minute interview and then they could have discussed the interview afterwards. He could have well, brought his little. His his menu. Well, <laughs> yes, his menu. Yeah. Well, you know, the other thing that could have happened is they could have asked questions instead of saying it seems like you do not want equality. I mean, where in the hell he ever got that idea I just don't know. I, maybe he's read tweets about me or, you know, pe people's perspectives of me. But wasn't the point then to ask me and let me clarify my positions? But I never got a chance. You know, I never really got a chance to, to, to answer his questions because they were so certain of who I was and what I stood for that, like you said, my humanity didn't matter. It didn't matter one bit. So I wish that there could have been an actual conversation and a listening, a two-way conversation. But that was never their intention. And um, and so there I sat. Well, just because I'm a former journalist and, and uh, know Dan's work so well, uh, this guy was a great journalist. He, he, he made his career interviewing and putting into perspective people who were misunderstood, people who were vilified. If you go back to the 90s and 2000s and study his writing and how he became popular, it was because like, oh, okay, uh, no one will go talk with these black athletes or controversial athletic figures and actually hear their side of the story and put them in a proper framing I'm going to do it. That's how he right. elevated. And so I'm looking at, well, how come Michelle Tafoya doesn't deserve an opportunity to define herself and to have open minded people listen to her response? Because your responses didn't matter because one of the <laughs> one of the things you did that I sort of disagreed with, but it was a great rope a dope strategy. You actually agreed with several of the things that they said, trying to diffuse the situation and say, hey, guys, you got me painted all wrong. I'm, I'm actually this and I agree with you on that and blah, blah. And, and, and that, that was I thought it was I get why she's doing it, because and, and I, I got to say this, Michelle, you should rewatch the interview because I'm t you looked brilliant and strong. Oh, and I, I, anybody I, I with a, a daughter or anybody with a son should go, hey, go watch this, Michelle Tafoya. This is what strength and intelligence actually looks like under fire. Well, I appreciate that more than you know. I'm curious, and I just want to turn the tables a little bit and ask you how, where you and Dan Levitard stand today and how a friendship that manifested itself through travel and social and all these different um, ways that you guys hung out, what happened? Uh, Deadspin 
started attacking me in my second employment with ESPN, uh, 2013 to 2015. And Deadspin uh, at that time was at the height of its power and bullying people. And I was being bullied by uh, Deadspin. And uh, Dan, this is my opinion, he'll have a different narrative, but my opinion is that, that Dan was the sports media personality probably most attached to me at the time. He needed to decouple himself or he could get hit by the, by the collateral damage, the shots being fired at me could end up turning on him. And so he started doing little calculated things to distance himself from me. And, and to some degree I understood it and wasn't bothered by it. It got to the point where it was just a bridge too far. And so he started talking about on his show one day about Tommy Craggs, who was the editor at Deadspin that had written, uh, been involved in writing some really negative stuff about me. And, and Dan was, said something celebrating him. And Dan knew uh, all the details of what Deadspin was doing and how inaccurate it was, but he just didn't have the courage to, to stand up and stand in the pocket. And, and eventually, he just backed completely away from me. And I was good with that. Not everybody is built for the kind of fire that you know I go through. And I understand that it's tough being my friend in this business. Mm -hmm. You're going to get asked about me. You're going to, you know, Whitlock says X, Y, and Z, and blah, blah, blah. And so, and then he went down a completely different path in terms of that's why he's surrounded by his minions and it's all calculated. Again, the, the Mike Ryan now pretends he's some kind of Latino. Uh, and again, I'm not, and he, I'm sure he is half Latino, but that's not the way he had been presenting himself until it became popular. He got the little black dude, Roy, who, you know, little suburban black dude that, you know, he ain't from the hood where I come from. He ain't, you know, he, he but again, I'm not going to, there's no blueprint for being black, but that, he's a black guy that white people are very comfortable with and he's comfortable being their black guy. And so they, they put a little cast of young people together that represent the woke point of view and yeah. uh, they needed some distance from me. And so I, I gave Dan that distance. I've never uh, been hypercritical of Dan, but I, I gotta say, I'm just telling you this, this interview has me so fired, I, I just, I find it repulsive. That's not the yeah. person that I knew. It's not sound journalism. It's not no. fair, it's unmanly. <laughs> no. it, yeah. it, 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 it's, it's unmanly. Three guys interviewing one person, let alone a woman. It took three of them to take you on in a secret attack? If, if they put in the email, hey, there's going to be three of us that are going to uh, interview you, you're going on to talk with Dan Levitar because right. you're Michelle Tafoya, the sideline reporter on the number one show in America. You're not, oh, I'm giving up this 30 minutes to engage with some producer and another jack off I've never heard of. Uh, you know what? I'm Are so you glad kidding you put, me? I know. You know what? That part of what you just said, I want to point out, I really appreciate. Because later I thought to myself, I don't have a lot of extra time <laughs> these days. I've got two teenagers, I've got a job. And so when I do these kinds of interviews, I generally assume they're going to be professional. Even if I disagree with the person on the other side, that's fine. I can handle it. But I expected it to be a prof <laughs> professional conversation. And it was the furthest thing from it. And I think that's what was so heinous about it and so ugly about it. And I guess there was even another person on their show, I, I'm hearing this, that didn't even think I was worth their time because of my stances, because of my opinions. Like, why are we having her on? And, you know, that is so problematic today that we are not looking at each other as human beings, that we're looking at each other as like these these commodities of hate. You know, these 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 little blocks of, like he said, checking boxes. I, I mean, it, it it's so disturbing to me that that's where we are. 
And I like to believe, and and I, I talked to a guy the other day who writes for the Dispatch who told me there is a huge chunk of people that are called the exhausted majority. And a lot of them are just stepping out of the conversation because they are exhausted. I can tell you my husband's one of them. He has been for a long time. And he does take, you know, he's got to be married to me. And so if one of his clients doesn't agree with my decision, you know, he's got to sort of tiptoe around that. And, you know, but he supports me because he knows me and because he respects me and because I'm human. And uh, so for it to go that far afield was just staggering to me. And, you know, thank you for acknowledging that I gave them, I gave them 30 minutes, 45 minutes of my day for them to just attack. Michelle, you made the mistake, though, of talking while conservative, and so they had to come (laughs) at you for that. And this, to me, is one of the biggest problems that we see. Everybody knows that the media is leftist. The sports media is more leftist than the overall media, and they never have any checks and balances on them. So if there is one or two of us that do step out, this is what's going to happen. And it's so it's not fair. It never should happen this way. But we're we're, this hopefully will be the first instance where we actually see some pushback on this. That 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 is why I left my job. I I was speaking to a young woman the other day who basically thinks I'm crazy for leaving what is arguably the most coveted sideline job in sports. And I made this decision years ago. This wasn't this year that I made. I made this decision in 2018 that I saw a country starting to fray. I wanted to be able to talk about it. I wanted to be able to be open about my thoughts about it. But I respected the image of Sunday night football they didn't want to court controversy. They asked me if I, they never stopped me from doing anything. I've spoke at con- conservative events. I've emceed conservative events. They never quashed that. I want to make that really clear. But when I started entertaining the idea of a podcast, they asked, can you just hold off? We agree with 95% of what you're saying, but we just don't want to bring this on to Sunday night football. You know what? I respected that because that's a that's a company with a, a, a product, which is Sunday Night Football, that does extraordinarily well for the company. And I'm part of that product. And I didn't want to bring shade to that. So I said, yes, I will hold off. Here's my notice. And that was 2018. I thought 2019 was going to be my last season. They asked me to get them through 2020 with the Super Bowl. Our Super Bowl got pushed to 2021, the 2021 season. So I hung in there. I hung in there. And so... But this is what I've wanted to do. I feel that we need some sane voices. I don't think of myself as what those people think of me. I think of myself as very common sense, middle ground, representing a lot of people who are afraid to talk. They're afraid to post on their Facebook page or Twitter because they're afraid of that backlash. I'm not afraid. I've been through it. I'm not afraid. And someone's got to stand up and say, I'm not apologizing for this opinion. I'm not afraid of you. You can bully me all you want. You can try to silence me. I'm still going to talk. And until more people stop apologizing, once you apologize a little, oh my gosh, they'll keep coming after you and keep coming after you until you shut up. That's what the the real left I'm not just talking about I'm not talking about actual liberalism and all Democrats. I'm talking about the left really wants. They want us to all shut up. They want to bully us and scare us into shutting up. And instead of engaging in actual debate with facts and um, values and things that really pertain to that debate, they don't want to do that. It's either because they're too lazy or because they don't have the facts on their side or a combination thereof. So they just show up with bullhorns and they yell until you shut up. They yell until no one can hear you. That's not America. That is not America. And so, you know, look, my dad was an Hispanic. Uh, His family immigrated here through from started in Spain down through Peru, came up. 
He always taught me I lived in the greatest country in the world, and I still believe that. With the faults and imperfections that every country on God's green earth has, and we've had ours, and we still have ours, but we're still the freest nation, and and, and unless we keep apologizing and being cowed by this left heavy-handedness, we have to stop. We, we, we need more courage. We need more courage and less apology. And, and so I just wanted to participate in that courage. I, I'm going to, I, I got to keep hammering this because there's a couple other points and I'm sorry for being this passionate about this because I do want to I love talk your passion, about Jason. Your, Don't apologize. Your, your, <laughs> all right. So again, this is somewhat personal for me because again, I know Dan, brother, both parents, the whole, his parents are, are fled Cuba. His parents fled Cuba. They're not leftists. They're not. This is a money play. Dan's not a leftist. This is about money. Wet finger in the air. Everybody in sports media is getting paid for their leftist point of view. And He's, he's cashing in on that with either DraftKings or FanDuel or whomever, him and John Skipper or whatever are, are, are doing that. But, but he, here's my, when, when you're these pretend leftists and th these pretend woke people and, and the whole rigged up cowardliness of the whole thing. I, I just, and again, because I know Dan and I know his career so well, uh, Charles Barkley does not have one opinion that's any different than Michelle Tafoya. Charles Barkley does not. I, I'm friends with Charles Barkley. Dan's friends with Charles Barkley. Dan loves to have Charles Barkley on his show. Charles Barkley thinks virtually everything Michelle Tafoya thinks and says so publicly. Dan Levitard would never allow two little jackoffs to browbeat and try to bully Charles Barkley. It would never happen. Dan would have, he, I've seen Dan snap on these guys. I've, Dan would have said, what, shut up, what are you doing? Take the camera off them, take, shut their mics off. This is Charles Barkley. This is not how we talk to Charles Barkley. Jim Brown, friend of mine, the all-time great football player, yeah. friend of mine, friend of Dan Levitar's. Jim Brown doesn't think anything different than Michelle Tafoya. Jim Brown comes on Dan's show. Dan wouldn't let two little jackoffs talk to Jim Brown the way he allowed these two little jackoffs to talk to Michelle Tafoya. Dan Levitar wouldn't hide in a corner while two little jackoffs try to browbeat Jim Brown or Charles Barkley. This is sexism. Oh, wow. This is sexist behavior. It, it's, it's clear, anybody, and I'm not gonna drag any of Dan and I's mutual friends into this, but they're some of the highest profile people in sports media. They know Dan. They know all of this that I'm talking about. Dan should be embarrassed. His friends should be embarrassed for him. They know everything that I'm, Charles Barkley believes everything Michelle Tafoya believes. Go find me the tape. And they've had Charles Barkley on their show 50 times in the last 10 years? Find me the tape yeah. of them trying to do Charles Barkley this way. This is sexism. Play and sexism does exist. And I know I get accused of it or, you know, because I'm allegedly conservative, because I have a biblical worldview, I'm supposed to be the sexist pig. Find me the tape of me doing this to any, if Maria Taylor came on this show and I didn't like the way Maria Taylor exited ESPN and I wrote critical things of her, if she came on this show, I would treat her like she was my mama or my sister. She would have plenty of time to talk. I wouldn't allow someone else, a contributor, anybody else, to talk disrespectfully, to make little mocking faces, to try to embarrass. Michelle Tafoy is a grown ass woman with a decorated <laughs> career, and he let two little children try to mock her on his show. This is sexist. 
You know, I hadn't it, even thought of this until you brought it up. And it's amazing. And the reason your view of this holds water with me is because you know him so well. And, you know, you've watched him conduct these other interviews. I should have probably done that a few times before I went on. But even then, as you said, if he talked to people, like-minded people, like Barkley, like Jim Brown, and gave them the courtesies that he gave them, I probably would have would have still talked to him. I would have expected the same thing. I would have expected to have that courtesy extended to me. Uh, that is an amazing thought. And, you know, I, I, I've always said I'm not going to use the woman card. I'm not going to use the sexist card because, I mean, that's how I've approached my whole career. Everyone said to me, how are you going to survive in a man's world? How have you, how have you flourished in a man's world? And I've always said, who says it's a man's world? I, I didn't say that. I walked into it saying, I'm a journalist and I'm going to go compete against other journalists. I don't care who they are, or where they come from or what their gender is or their, their biological sex. I don't care. I'm going to do a job and I'm going to work really, 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 really hard at it until I'm as good as I want to be. And so I never, ever wanted to play that card. But you make a compelling point. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would absolutely agree that this was a sexist play because they would never come in and do this to a man and just let it go on like we've been saying throughout the show. Time after time, just the muting of the microphones, getting together, huddling up. Yeah. What are we going to say to her next? And when you were giving your points and they would take you from one topic to another and it, really, when when you're a conservative, they just want to call you a racist, bigoted, sexist, homophobe. And if they can get yeah. there in any way, they will. And they will not want to hear your argument because they don't believe that what you have to say is of any value. They just need to mm. get their talking points in, let you be the dummy that is taking the body blows and, and get as far down this road. But what are they even accomplishing when they're doing that, I, right? Like speaking to the choir? I, that's a perfect question to ask. To what end was this interview conducted? To, to, to prove a point, to prove that I am some sort of devil? Was that their, was that their goal? Um, to what end does does that have any productive contribution to the world? To what end? And, and that's the question I ask, too, about, you know, when they have these affinity groups at my kids' schools where they separate kids out because of their race or their uh, ethnicity and have these little powwows and kind of make the other kids go, why, why is this happening? To what end? Whom does that help? Wouldn't we be better served by keeping all these kids together to discuss their different opinions, different experiences, different worldviews, and find some common ground? I mean, that to me, an exchange of ideas is what education, is what school should be about. But we've divided into this tribalism, and they were trying to hit me on everything. Their Florida law, the don't say gay bill, which again, to what end, what do we accomplish by teaching kindergarten through grade three, by integrating into the curriculum of those precious, valuable years, anything about gender or sex or sexual or anything about that. What, to what end? I mean, I want my kid to learn to read, add, you know, let's have some art time. Let's have some music time. Let's talk about history. Let's talk about things that pertain to K through three. And, and you want to call that homophobic? That, uh, sorry. Well, here's what I'm going to do, because there's another name I'm going to drop here that's involved in this. John Skipper, who, you know, is partnered with Dan on Metal Arc Media. I know John Skipper. John Skipper hired me and worked with me for two years at ESPN and eventually fired me. John Skipper loves to purport to be this great friend of female journalists, uh, particularly ones that he can flirt with, but I'll leave that alone for now. Uh, but I, I'm going to put this interview uh, in, in front of John Skipper, and, and I'm going to ask him as, you know, he and Dan owe you an apology. 
And I'm going to put this in front of John Skipper, and, and, and I'm going to put it in front of Dan as well, uh, and just say, hey, man, what are y'all doing? Seriously. Because, again, you're asked to what end. I'm going to tell you what, the end, what it feels like, looks like to me, is that when you have a guilty conscience, when, you're, when you have sold out for money to this degree, when you have betrayed all the values that you use to build your career. And again, Dan Levitar for many years, 15, 20 years, was in the conversation for the best sports journalist working in America at that time. He intentionally sought out the misunderstood and explained their story, sought out the reviled and explained their story, was a friend to people that the rest of the media treated poorly. Kind of like how you're being treated uh, poorly and others that anybody that sticks to any kind of conservative value. He used to be the guy that would come in and say, hey, I'm not going to treat this person like a pariah. I'm going to treat them like a human being. They're one of, you know, I don't know if he was religious or not, but they're one of God's creatures as well. Let's hear them out. Let's let the world judge them based on what they, what they say. And again, Levitar, John Skipper in particular, pretends to be a friend to female uh, sports journalists. I'm not trying to feed you gas, but if someone spends a decade on America's number one television show, America's number one sporting event, does it at such a high level, I can't find, I've never heard anyone say a disparaging word about Michelle Tafoya, and I've been in this business, and I'd love to hear disparaging comments about anybody. I, I, I <laughs> seek it out. I can't find anybody that's ever said anything about Michelle Tafoya. So this is an accomplished, and before I knew Michelle Tafoya, you can go look at it, because I don't know Michelle, Michelle that well. Uh, but before I knew, I was saying, it's like, this is, this is great. This is the epitome of how you handle the sidelines. And, and, and so if you can treat someone like that the way they did, John Skip, I need to know what's going on with John Skipper, what's going on with Dan Levitard. Where, where have they pivoted? Or are they sure they're being consistent with the values they built their brands on and built their names on? This is not how you treat oh, anybody at the top of their profession but certainly a woman at the top of her profession in a field that had been dominated by men, there should have been the utmost respect. She should have gotten more respect than Charles Barkley. It's easier for Barkley to do what he does than for Michelle Tafoya to have done what she did. And I'm just sorry, it's easier uh, for, for Barkley and for me. Again, I say it all the time. Find me the woman as fat as me who's had my career. <laughs> Find me one. Find me one woman who's had my career. It's easier for us, even as a black man. If you can be my side. And there was times when I was on ESPN, I was nearly 400 pounds. Find me the woman that, that gets that opportunity, gets the paychecks I got from ESPN and Fox Sports who get to be 150, 200 pounds overweight. And this yeah. is what we're doing. I, it, it's uh, it's so interesting. You're looking at this from so many interesting perspectives that I hadn't even considered, and it, this is enlightening for me. And and even though I was the one that that lived through those really uncomfortable moments and minutes and what seemed like eternity, and I will tell you this too: there was one moment in the whole thing, Jason, and both of you, that, that I thought, should I? end this. This is stupid. Should I end this? But in that split second, while I was making that decision, I knew what would happen if I did. I would be called a coward. I would be called all kinds of things for back, you know, for, oh, she couldn't handle the heat. And so in that split second, it was, it was a split second that I had this inner monologue going on. I said, you just take a breath and hang in there because th th they would love it if you would stomp off angry and you're not going to do that. So it, it really was a decision in the middle of it that, you know, and, and I've, listen, I talked to another friend of Dan Levitard's and I'm not going to mention this person's name because 
I didn't ask to, I didn't get permission. But I called this person later and I said, this is what happened. And the person said to me, you should have called me before you went on there. The last time I went on there was about seven years ago. And I told Dan, I'd never do it again. I told Dan, I wouldn't work with him. I told Dan, I would, if he were my employee, I would fire him. But they're still, they're, they're still friends. But this human being that told me this said, yeah, I would have told you not to go on. Hmm. Now, I'm not as familiar with his content as I used to be when he was a radio show in Miami. And so Dan and I disconnected probably around 2015, 2016, uh, somewhere. Around. And so I'm not as familiar. Uh, you know, I would occasionally catch what, what they were doing and I could see the, the, the pivot to the left, uh, hardcore, and I'm sitting there, well, hold on, man. The family fled Cuba, yeah. fled this progressive, communist, Marxist, the whole deal, you know. Maybe I don't know, maybe, maybe they all voted for uh, Jimmy Carter, and I, I don't, but that's not my impression I got from meeting his family and engaging mm -hmm. with his family. The, the, the values that I saw him implement that made him great. Again, I, Michelle, you have no idea to know this, but again, this is what I'm just sitting here, his demonization of you. Dan Levitar once wrote, the Heat were playing the, the New York Knicks in a playoff game, and Dan basically called Patrick Ewing a monkey and got in all kinds of trouble. He, in a column, and not he didn't didn't slip out of his mouth to blah 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 in a column. He basically called Patrick Ewing a monkey. It set off all this controversy, and uh, me and a few other uh, black people jumped to to defend him and be like, and again because it, it wasn't those exact words, but that was the inference, and he got a lot of heat for it, and the people, you know, defended him at, at the time. So he he's he's faced the vilification of. Right the left and being taken out of context and, and having an inappropriate moment try to use to define all of you. Uh, he's been through that. And so to, to see him turn around and join the whole lynch mob is, is just embarrassing. And, and I just, to, the, the, to not give you the respect, don't be offended, Jill. I won't be. Don't be offended. But like, if, <laughs> If, if he had invited Jill Savage on the show and let Mike Ryan and Roy Bellamy start throwing in questions, I'd almost, I'd, I'd kind of get it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Jill Savage is, is, you know, she's a cut below Dan Levitar. But Michelle Tafoya is a peer of Dan Levitar's. They're same age set, same level of accomplishment. She's coming on the show specifically to engage with Dan, and 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 Michelle. I don't know if you know this. I want and Justin. There's a clip. The very first clip I asked for is Dan's original introduction of you as a guest on the show. This is 15 minutes before you came on the air, and okay. so I, I want to play. I want to play that clip. Just to say, this is intentional what he did. They were trolling you and using you to court controversy and chaos. I just don't see how you do it to Michelle Tafoya. But do we, I think we had that clip, Justin, uh, if we could play that. You know, Michelle Tafoya is around the corner. Put on the poll, please, Roy, at Levitard Show. How is Tafoya going to go? Chaos, inflammatory, awkward. Or cordial are your choices. Michelle Tafoya will be here in a second. Do you think they recorded I, that clip gonna... after uh, after the interview? I just wonder if they recorded that after the interview. I really do because no, they, by then he, he no, knew. No, no, no. They he, did. He, they did. They, were... they they did. Uh, yeah, because one, he's wearing two different outfits. He's got a ah! different hat on yeah. in that interview than the hat that he wore in yours. But. Yeah. Again, this goes back to intent and them mm -hmm. reveling in. Hey, we're going to treat Michelle Tafoya disrespectfully here in about 15 minutes. <laughs> Guys, hit the polls and 
Uh, wait till you see what we do to Michelle Tafoya. You're going to love it. You know, I, I, I don't I, believe I a, it. You don't? Well, I, no, I do. I, I can. I can see that that is the way that it goes. But to Jason's point of they should have never treated you with this level of disrespect, like in internally in my mind, the fact that you could go on their show and be just cast aside like this, the, the fact that they would just attack you the way that they did. I just in my heart, I don't want to believe that that's even possible. Yeah, you and me both, Jill. <laughs> now we both know that it is. You know, I, I have a friend uh, who is an author who once talked to me about Twitter in this way, and he said, "It there is a sport out there of who can I get? Who's the most famous person I can get to retweet or get angry with me about my tweet?" And it's I think they called it fishing or something. I don't remember what this what they named this. But this feels kind of like that in retrospect and with this conversation and with seeing that. Let's see how badly we can beat her up, you know, thinking if they think that I am a big name, which I I, I don't know. It, it, was that their mission just to say, who's the, the biggest name we can get that we can, we can absolutely throttle? I don't know. Hmm. Well, I wish they would try Charles Barkley next. That that would impress me. Or you know what? Give me a call. Uh, you know, <laughs> after watching, after watching you beat them up, I, I I'd love to get a piece of, of that group of idiots. That was Mo, Larry, and Curly. Uh, yeah. And and what, what's what's comical is they weren't even aware that they had gotten beaten up. That's how well, stupid they were. You know, and I kind of. As you said, I was doing this rope-a-dope, and to a certain extent, yes, I guess I was. I think sometimes when people are that convinced of their opinions, and, and, and even stupid or ignorant ones, I kind of think, you know, what am I missing? <laughs> what, what memo didn't I read? What book didn't I get in college that, that taught these guys this? Where are they going with this? But I've had, I've had a lot of people reach out to me and say, these guys misspoke, there was misinformation, there was disinformation, there were lies, there were, they don't understand what is being taught, what isn't being taught, yada, yada. So the bottom line is they were just spewing crap. And I, I was trying to make sure I didn't go down a rabbit hole that was going to reflect negatively on me. I wanted to be true to my values, and I think that I was. But I also didn't want to get so much in the dirt with them that I looked as bad as they did. They live in a bubble and they are never questioned about their beliefs the way that conservatives are questioned on a daily basis. Everything that they hear from culture and media reflects what they believe. So then when they actually have somebody that they can go up against, they say, oh, you know, like, let's attack. But. They, they don't think that anybody is ever going to see it from the viewpoint that the three of us are sitting here talking about. Yeah. Michelle, I, I, yeah. I do want to I want to I want to pivot a little bit and, okay. and give my, my small little criticism or, or I'll advice. take it. OK. At, yeah. At one point, at one point, you let them talk you into basically saying America was founded on racism and slavery. And and I completely reject that and don't think it's a factual interpretation of America. In, in America started in, let's say, in 1619, the country's founded in 1776. Slavery was a global phenomenon yes. at that time. Yes, a it global was. phenomenon. So yeah. it, it, it was a continuation of what was going on around the globe. It, it, we didn't come over here, hey, let's start this country so we can have slavery. They had slavery right. in England until 1833. Right. Uh, and th they ended uh, anyway, we were 30 years after England in abolishing slavery. Our bad. Uh, we're a new country. They're a much older country and had a lot longer time to deal with and correct that than we had. So mm -hmm. we're 30 years behind them. Hats off to yeah, them. Our, they our, beat us by well, 30 years listen. despite having a... <laughs> 300 uh, listen, year head start. It's, yeah, yeah go and, ahead. I'm sorry. and I agree with you. No, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt. I agree with you. And I think, you know, 
I, 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 the notion that we were, that there were slaves. Yeah. People love to ignore the fact that this was a worldwide phenomenon. They want to make it a, it was an American thing. We hate America because of it. We should still punish everyone in America because of it, all of that. And, and I, I don't agree with that. I think in that moment and I, and I'm not totally clear on every word that was said, but yes, we used slavery to build a lot of the, the institutions um, that we had in have in America. So I, I, I don't agree that the country was built on slavery, and I don't believe it was built for slavery. And some people even go that far, that it was built purely to be a slave nation. That's not true. So I'm on the same page with you. And yeah, I probably stepped in it there. Or, I think it was wrong with them. I, I, yeah, well, I think thanks. it was. I think it was a brilliant strategy. I, I really do. I'm, I'm because I'm watching fighter. you in the moment. <laughs> yeah, you're in the moment, and you're like, "Oh my God, these guys want to fight," and so, and they're coming at you from all the. And so, hey, I'm gonna give them this one just so mm. to see if I can. Because again, you you weren't there to fight, and so you no. were, let me give them this, and maybe this will end the fight, and we can actually have a productive conversation. I saw that going through your head. I'm going to give you another <laughs> little tactic that they, just in case this ever happens to you again, another little tactic yes, they love to do. And it, it's uh, the Roy Bellamy when they brought him in. Roy, come on in here. And this dude, uh, they, they didn't even tell us that the movie The Watchmen had to tell us about uh, the Tulsa Massacre. And, 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 and you know, they didn't teach that in history. And, and I'm just like, hey, guys, every incident, every thing that happened in America is not going to be taught in U.S. history. Or your kids will never leave U.S. history class. Mm -hmm. there were only, if we taught everything. And so here's what I'll say. To, here's, let me give you another example of what's never taught in U.S. history. The guy oh, had a yes. tragedy, Jim Jones. No, no, the, and, and this is what people don't understand. That was predominantly black people that Jim Jones, a Marxist communist, Hostile to God, he's a former minister, he talks these people into joining him in Guyana, mostly black people, gets them to disavow their Christian views, adopt this Marxist views and these communist views, and gets them to kill themselves. That was a black tragedy more traumatic than Tulsa, more dead black bodies in Guyana, American dead black bodies in Guyana, tricked by a progressive leftist Marxist teaching the same ideology that they're now trying to subtly sneak into schools. That's a tragedy that they are not teaching mm -hmm. in USA. There's all kinds of things. And black people, we've been convinced, and their little liberal friends have been convinced that you know what black history is? It's a series of tragedies that must be taught. And I reject that because nobody, no country, no other ethnic group teaches their history as a series of tragedies and things that were done to them. People teach history about what they accomplished and what they overcame and what they did. And so to sit here and again, the Roy is a young person and maybe he's an idiot, maybe he does no research on his own, but America has not hid from its racist past. It has not. No. Anytime the number one television show basically in the history of America is Roots, and I would suggest if you haven't watched it, everybody needs to go watch it. Everybody in my generation did watch it. Other than the yep. Super Bowl, the final episode yep. of Roots is the most popular thing, I think, in the history of American TV. We haven't hid from it no. at all. We've no. Not only have we not hid from it, we had a civil war and sacrificed hundreds of thousands of lives addressing it. We had a civil rights movement where people died addressing it. And so some history, some of these little details of what happened in individual cities, you got to go find out for yourselves and do the research yourself if that's what floats your boat. There are a lot of people, and, and this will never be told or taught, but Doug Williams and I uh, are still friendly. We used to be more friendly, but uh, Doug Williams is a great NFL quarterback. He, he used to talk to me about Eddie Robinson and his philosophy as Gramley's coach. And, you know, 
I'm not sure if Doug would repeat the story now, but he used to tell me this all the time. Eddie Robinson never talked to his players or his kids about racism. This is what Doug Williams told me. And he said, because Eddie Robinson wanted those kids to leave Grambling University feeling like they were King Kong and could take on the world and feeling like nothing could stop them. And so he never wanted to convince them that there were these forces out there that were going to stop him. So he never talked about racism because he wanted them looking in the windshield constantly because there's more opportunity in the windshield than in the rearview mirror. The left and people like Jim Jones that talked to a bunch of black people into committing suicide and people like Dan Levitar who, who have no legitimate interest in black people moving ahead, they want us constantly looking in the rear view mirror and say, oh, you didn't tell me that happened in my rear view mirror. Oh, you didn't ha tell me this. Therefore, you're my oppressor. People looking in the rear view mirror often crash into the opportunities instead of seizing and taking advantage of the opportunities in front of them. They crash and never get a chance to accomplish them. And that's what this obsession yeah. With, oh my God, you got to know every tragedy that happened or you've been denied your history. I wonder I how many of I wonder how talking? many of the no. And, and by the way, one of my favorite books of all time, and I know I'm gonna, people are going to go, oh, she wanted to say this to make herself look virtuous. No, one of my favorite books of all time is Booker T. Washington, Up From Slavery, because he did exactly that. He looked ahead of him. He constantly looked for opportunities, no matter how small, and worked his tail off to accomplish so many, so many amazing things. I wonder how many people know about his history. Uh, I, I, I just wonder, you know, if we're going to talk about all the bad, where is the recognition of all of the tremendous stories out there? And, uh, yeah, it's, I feel like this is kind of people hang on to this issue because it is contentious, because politicians can fundraise off of it. And because if we all just said, Hey, let's, let's get along, there wouldn't be that opportunity to fight about other things. And so we name call and we label people and it's constant right now. And, and, you know, if you're not racist, you're white supremacist. If you're not that, you're homophobic or you're anti-LGBTQ. If you're pro-life, even if you're a woman who's pro-life, you're anti-woman. I happen to be pro-choice with exceptions. And, you know, I, I don't think that if you're eight months pregnant, it's probably a good idea to have an abortion. That's just me. But uh, I, this, this, this co constant battling over these hot button issues and, and you know, Today, as you and I are talking, Roe v. Wade was overturned. And instead of getting to work, if Nancy Pelosi wants this codified so badly, then get to work and write a law instead of calling Supreme Court justices names, potentially making them targets, as we've seen they have been. That's not leadership. That's not leadership. I, I, we are dying for real, legitimate Leadership. I, I don't know where it is, Jason. I don't know where it is. I don't know when it's coming. I'm not sure if it's if it's coming. Uh, the whole system seems rigged to pit us against each other and yes. to see the worst in each other. And again, you can get uh, sponsorships and uh, you know. Just I, 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 I'm I sat there and I'm sorry for being this passionate about it that, uh, you know, we've spent a whole hour talking about. But I am just as because I know Dan. I know what he used to stand for. I know what to see a great journalist pivot like this and to, to treat you a human being, a good person. It, it, I disagree with you on the uh, pro-choice thing. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make you a bad person. Right. Doesn't make me a great person. It, it, no. it, you know, uh, it, 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 it. But my God, if you can't see the humanity of a mother coming on and talking about what her kids are experiencing in school, and just let her talk about that, 
And even if you want, even after you let her go and say, well, that's just one story and that's her take, blah, blah. But again, how come a parent voice can't be heard? Because that's what you were. You were a parent, not some political operative coming on his show. It, it just. Uh, so anyway, what, what's going on? What are you doing on Sideline Sanity? We're trying to bring sanity into the conversation. We are treating guests with respect and listening. I'm doing a lot of listening and a lot of learning, and I think people are along with me. And we bounce around from topics. My first guest was Bob Costas. He and I have a lot of political differences, a lot, but we're <laughs> friends. We're friends, you know. We are. We remain friends. Um, and and then you know we'll we'll we've had a really great array Tony Dungy we've had on we haven't just had sports people on uh, we've had a lot of writers um, a lot of really just interesting thought leaders and you can find us at Sideline Sanity and we're we're all the uh, all the podcasts are are found and it's brand new you know I think we're three four weeks in now and it's going great and. I'm just enjoying it because I'm enjoying having deeper conversations than what 30 seconds on the sideline can allow me. And I'm enjoying having civil conversations and demonstrating for people that they are possible and that they are productive and that they can learn something from someone who has a different point of view from them. So that's that's what I'm trying to do. And I am just so grateful you took the time to talk to me. By the way, Jason Whitlock is appearing on Sideline Sanity next week. So that'll be good. And I, I can't wait to talk to you about a, a lot of this stuff. It's your perspective is unique. It's valuable. It's important. You're you 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 are courageous. And we are we are experiencing a huge dearth of courage in this country. We, we need more. We need more. We need more people to, to just and, and we need people to have arguments based on facts. When people after Roe v. Wade get overturned say uh, abortion is now illegal in the United States, that's false. That is false. That is not what happened with this decision. Not at all. So people need to take a breath and understand. And of course, while we're all begging to be taught American history, what about civics? So people do understand this stuff. Uh, it, trying to explain it to my 13-year-old daughter today was was interesting because there's so much involved. And it's not easy, but it's it's the country that we live in. We need to understand the Constitution and what, what we stand for. Michelle, thank you so much um, just for going out on a limb. I know, you know, we are we are doing very similar things. You're at a much yeah, higher I level than myself. But oh, don't say that. Don't say that. I, but I, I love that you have the courage, right? And that's what it takes. It, it's not going to be all of these other people over there that are going to save this country. It's going to be Jason doing his show. It's going to be you doing your show, whatever I can do. We all have to look at ourselves now and say, what are we going to do about this? Yeah, yeah, it's very easy to just float along with the tide, whatever tide, whatever direction it's going. I, I don't want to float. I don't like the direction the tide is going. Uh, so even if it means swimming against the current, which is hard work, it's worth doing, right, Jason? <laughs> it is worth doing. Uh, Michelle, I gotta say this, and we're gonna, I hope I don't get in trouble. I didn't realize you had such athletic arms. I can't, when I come to sideline, uh, <laughs> sideline sanity, I'm gonna, are you a former athlete? I'm, I'm still a bit of an athlete, but I'm not like a basketball yeah. player. So I just, I just, I work out, man. I work out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Great to Great see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, uh, that's tomorrow. Won't see you tomorrow. That'll be Sunday. I'll see you Monday. I just want, I wanna be, I just want, I wanna be, I just want.